me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Then I'll move and live and grow in you and you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and Lord, as we have heard your summons that echoes in our hearts, your summons to follow you on the mission, the mission to spread your love to all those around us. Fill us this night with your Spirit. Speak to our hearts that we may hear anew your call to be your disciples. All of this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In the course of his teaching, he said, Be on guard against the scribes and the Pharisees, who like to parade around in their robes and accept marks of respect in public, front seats in the synagogues, and places of honor at banquets. These men devour the savings of widows and recite long prayers for appearance. It is they who will receive a severe condemnation. Taking a seat opposite the treasury, Jesus observed the crowd putting money into the collection box. Many of the wealthy put in sizable amounts. But one poor widow came and put in two small copper coins worth two cents. He called his disciples over and told them, I want you to observe that this poor widow contributed more than all the others who donated to the treasury. They gave from their surplus wealth, but she, from her want, gave all that she had to live on.
the anticipation. <laughs> Thank you again for being here this evening on our third night of our mission. And we call this the parish mission because the hope is that it will inspire all of us on the mission that we have been sent by our Lord, by our Rabbi, by our Savior Jesus, our best friend. In fact, when we gather together for Mass, the very last words at Mass are that which should be embedded on our minds as we leave the liturgy each time. The word Mass is really the sending forth, for we receive, we get fed, and then are called to go out and feed all those around us. The word Mass comes from the Latin misit, which means to send. And those are the very last words we hear at Mass. Ite misa est in Latin means you are now sent forth on the mission, you and I, to be Jesus' disciples, his followers in the world. Not too long after I was ordained a priest, I was uh, sitting on the airplane and I was reading my Bible and I'm reading my Bible, minding my own business and the gentleman who was sitting next to me was very well dressed, very well dressed with his tie and everything and uh, he kind of, you know, you're, when you're sitting on the airplane, you're all bunched up because they want to make as much money as possible so they don't give you a lot, of, a lot of room. And so you're squished together like a sardine. And so uh, he couldn't help it, as many of us, he couldn't help it, but look at uh, what it is that I'm reading, as many of us can't help it when we're on the airplane to kind of look at what the other person is reading. And he saw that I was reading the Bible. And so he goes, <laughs> and I said, oh, here it comes. <laughs> and he says, you really believe all that's in there? He says to me, you really believe all that's in there? And I said, of course I do. I believe all that's in the Bible. And he says, really? And I said, really? He says, you mean you believe in that uh, story of um, that guy with the whale? I said, you mean Jonah? Okay. And I said, yes, I just told you, I believe in everything that's in the Bible. And he says, well, how did it happen? How did it happen? How did, how did Jonah make it in to the whale? And I said, I don't know. I have no idea. But when I get to heaven, I will ask him. <laughs> and to that, he thought he was all smart, you know, and he says, mm, well, what if he's in hell? And I said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> But this story, as humorous as it is, illustrates to us a very profound problem that all of us have. And that is that we think we know it all. We think we have all of the answers. And Jesus says, unless you become like a little child, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. In fact, he calls over a child and says, take your example. Our faith is to be simple, not complicated, but simple. You know, I believe that I am a priest today because of the very simple faith and the prayers 
a very, of a very simple woman, my beloved grandmother, who raised me in Poland before I arrived here in the United States. My parents left myself and my brother in Poland in the care of my grandparents and when they immigrated here to the United States. And my grandma, or babcia as I call her in Polish, has no education. In fact, she is illiterate. She cannot read or write. She doesn't know theology or philosophy. She never went to school. She cannot answer complicated catechism questions or the objections to our faith posed to her by her Jehovah Witness neighbors who attack her over and over again and why, and why is it that she has images in her house or statues or why is it that she eats kishka you know what kishka is blood sausage mmm yummy <laughs> or charnina blood soup since as they point out it is prohibited by the Bible they say that's in their interpretation of the Bible, of course. But what she does have, and what she instilled in me, was a childlike trust, unconditional love, acceptance of others, and a non-judgmental spirit that are all fruits of a deep life of prayer and union with God. And this is something that I caught from her not something that she taught me. For I am convinced that faith is not something that is taught, but caught. Our village priest was an eloquent orator. He was a great speaker and a great teacher. And he studied philosophy, psychology, and theology. And he prepared me very well for my first communion by having me memorize my catechism. But his life didn't teach me when he refused to bury a man who drowned due to his alcoholism because the man didn't go to church, leaving the grieving family at the cemetery without a priest, even though the teenage daughter of the man who drowned in the river begged him to bury her father or when he refused to allow children to receive their first Holy Communion because their parents were members of the Communist Party and refused to be married in the church so he wouldn't allow their children to receive Holy Communion. That didn't teach me. Or when he coerced couples into marriage, threatening them with not baptizing their children or burying them if they died, if they didn't get married. He even threatened my grandfather who didn't go to church by telling him he would not give him a funeral if he should die. And my grandfather to that answered, well, Father, what makes you think that, you know, I'm going to die before you? <laughs> In fact, the priest did die before my grandfather. <laughs> you see, I didn't learn much from him even though he knew a lot. But my grandmother, who knew very little in terms of studies or theology or philosophy, she taught me with her life, a life of prayer, as she endured an alcoholic husband who beat her, immense poverty, a repressive regime that frowned upon church attendance, a family environment where the husband ridiculed her allegiance to the church and made fun of her devotional prayer practices like praying the rosary. In today's church, we hear much clamor, much talk about the need for teaching and for people to get to know their catechism. And you know, all of this is so very wonderful. Yet the best teaching in recent memory has been done by the humble, non-judgmental, and tender example of our beloved Holy Father, Pope Francis. He's a living, breathing, walking catechism, just like my grandmother. As my babcha, through the example of her life, a holy life, brought me 
to appreciate and ultimately dedicate my life to the spreading of our beautiful faith, so has Pope Francis brought millions closer to God and to the gospel. For the many people who come into contact with you on a daily basis, you may be the only gospel they will ever hear or they will ever read. You may be the only gospel they will ever come into contact with or the only catechism that they will ever lay their eyes upon. You know, my grandfather was an avowed member of the Communist Party. He never went to church. In fact, he would ridicule us when we would get dressed on Sunday morning for going to church with my grandma, myself, and my, and my brother. We would get ready every Sunday morning to go to church, and he would make fun of that. He'd say, work is my prayer. Why are you wasting your time? And my grandmother never challenged him. You know what she did? She prayed for him. And she hoped against all hope that God would touch him one day. And on a Tuesday of one week, my grandfather went to the doctor because he had problems, digestive problems. He went to the doctor and was diagnosed on that Tuesday in one week with colon cancer. The following Sunday, I get up in the morning and I go into the kitchen and there he is sitting all dressed up in the kitchen, sitting by the stove. And I say, why are you all dressed up? Then he says, I'm going to church with you today. Hmm. Now he got, he was all dressed up. We would all dress up as well when we would go to church. Yeah, we wouldn't dare go to church not dressed up. Even though it, it, was a, it was hard work. We didn't have running water. Didn't have washing machines. We'd take our bath on the Saturday, our weekly bath, whether we need it or not. <laughs> But we would prepare to go to church because it was important. And here we have showers and running water and we just roll out of bed sometimes. And, and then we come and we complain. And I said, it was I was questioning my grandfather. My grandmother ran into the kitchen because she heard the commotion and she grabbed me and she says, shh, let's just go along with it. And my grandfather eventually made his peace with the church, went to confession, and he died eight months later of colon cancer, but he died at peace. Something that the communist system could have never given him. The Lord Jesus gave him what he needed at that moment in his life. And I believe it's the fruit of her prayers. As I believe today, it's the fruit of my grandmother's prayers that I am here today before all of you here at St. Anthony today. And you know, when I think of God, I think of my grandma. I think of Pope Francis. I think of Mother Teresa. I think, in other words, of compassion. Compassion. That is a picture of the heart of God towards us all filled with overflowing, gut-grabbing compassion that acts on our behalf for you and for me. It is the compassion that will meet us in our darkest of hours to bring us the brightest of lights. My grandma embodies this type of selfless and merciful love as was demonstrated by her actions a few years back, about three or four years ago, when one of my cousins who moved to England, met and eventually married a man from Kenya, a African man from Kenya. She met him in London, where she lives today. And this was devastating news to her parents, my aunt and uncle, very educated people, 
My grandma was born before the war and during that time education was not available, especially during the war. All the schools were closed before the second and during the Second World War. But my parents grew up during the communist system, as did my aunts and uncles. And so they got a great education under the communist system. They learned a lot. And the news of their daughter marrying a man from Kenya, an African, a black man, was devastating news to them. So much so that they disavowed her. They disowned her and have never even met their four grandchildren because of their bigotry, racism, and misconceptions about people who are different than them. Now, my aunt and uncle are educated people. They own a business in Poland, and they believe themselves to be very intelligent human beings. They claim to know a lot, and maybe they do know a lot in terms of stuff. They learned a lot. And yet it was my babcha, my grandma, who embraced my cousin and congratulated her on her wedding. She was the first one to embrace her, welcome her along with her husband, her African husband, welcome her into her, her home along with their four grandchildren. And in my grandmother's home, when you enter there, there's a big picture of me with my collar because she's very proud that I'm a priest. And alongside me, there's a big picture of my cousin with her husband and her four kids for all the neighbors to see. She told my cousin how happy she was for her and that she blessed their union and wished them peace and joy. My cousin sobbed as she recounted this story to me. And she says that even when she told my grandma that her husband was a Muslim, all that my grandma replied was, there is only one God and he loves us all. There's only one God. Does it take education to know that? That there is one God and He loves us all? My grandma continues to amaze me with her unconditional love, acceptance, and non-judgmental spirit. And I pray daily to emulate and embody just a little bit of her Christ-likeness in my ministry as a priest. Would that all of us heed the call of St. Francis of Assisi, whose feast day we celebrated yesterday, to teach with our lives, as he said, not so much with our words. He said, preach the gospel at all times and only when necessary should you use words. Isn't that the example of the saints of today, like Mother Teresa? Isn't that the example of our current Pope, Pope Francis? to only when necessary use our words, only when necessary. You know, in my first parish, when I was ordained a priest, we had adoration of the Blessed Sacrament every Friday. Every Friday we had adoration of the Blessed Sacrament and the people who would come, there'd be uh, they would sign up and there would be a whole group of them that would come. And it wasn't a really big parish, but there was lots of, lots of people who would come that day. And it was the people who would go to church every day. Very prayer-filled people. Every, you know, they would be there on their knees before the Blessed Sacrament, adoring the Blessed Sacrament. Well, one week, we got a funeral on a Friday. And we needed to have the funeral at the time that the adoration was scheduled. And so I said, adoration will have to be interrupted for a couple of hours when we have the funeral. Well, I thought the Second World War had started. <laughs> Over again. It was 1939, September 1st in Poland, all over again. Bombs went off because 
they would have adoration interrupted for a couple of hours. What is your idea of God? Is God somewhere out there? You know, I love you, Lord. Oh, you're so wonderful. Anybody can do that. The Bible says it's easy to say, I love God whom I do not see. But it's hard to say, I love God in the people that are before me. And yet we are called to recognize and to love the Christ around us. Not the Christ somewhere out there floating around. Anybody can do that. And so when these people, I was in the parish office and this group, they came in and they were badgering the secretary. Father Adam has no respect for the Blessed Sacrament. How could he interrupt our prayer time with Jesus? Doesn't he know we have our appointment every week? And she's trying to explain to them that, you know, we have to have this funeral during this time because this is the only time that the mortuary can work it out and all this. And finally I had it because I was in the office overhearing this. I opened the door. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, all of you. Well, first then I, I said, hello. And they said, oh, hello, father. <laughs> <laughs> you know many people who will smile and tell you how wonderful you are to your face and then behind your back they'll put a knife in you know oh, it's so good to see you <laughs> and I thought to myself well, they won't say that in just a little bit <laughs> and I said listen all of you you say you're people of prayer oh yes father <laughs> we're people of prayer I said, your people of prayer, stop praying, stop, stop praying, stop praying because whatever you're doing ain't working. <laughs> it's not working. Because if your prayer does not lead you to have compassion for this grieving family that has just lost a loved one, that you are so focused on me and Jesus, me and my time with Jesus, that you have no compassion for this family. Stop whatever you're doing, because it ain't working, and start over. <laughs> and that should be the same thing for all of us. If our prayer practices, if our prayer life, if our religion does not lead us to have compassion, understanding, empathy, kindness towards all those we meet, no matter how quirky they may be, how irritable they may be, no matter who that person is, if it doesn't lead you towards a life of compassion, stop and start over. For God is real. We believe in the God of the incarnation, the God made flesh. You cannot love God if you do not love your neighbor. That's why Jesus puts it together. He says, love of God and love of neighbor go hand in hand. You can't say, I love God and at the same time say, hate your neighbor. Jesus says, the person who does that is a liar. This gospel that I read for all of you is very poignant and very powerful to me. And I hope I can explain it a little bit for all of you because here we have Jesus addressing the scribes and the Pharisees, the very learned people during his day, very religious people, the religious people of his day. And all of us are here today. That means we're religious. And there's nothing wrong with being religious. It gives you meaning in your life. But we got to work on having the right kind of religion. Interior religion. Not a religion for show. And Jesus is addressing all these people during his day who were religious. And he's giving them 
this example of this widow. This very insignificant person during his day. And he's talking here to people who loved their religious traditions more than God and neighbor. They loved their interpretations of the Old Testament more than God and neighbor. They loved their money more than God and neighbor. They loved their political power more than God and neighbor. <clears throat> they talked a good line but did not live it. They were epitomes of hypocrisy. They were blind to God, God's love, God's word, God's truth, and God's son. And Jesus is admonishing them as he comes over and over again to admonish us. You see, the gospel, the Bible says, is supposed to be like a sword that should penetrate our hearts to convict us to look into our, our lives to see how it is that we need to change. You see, one of the problems in our lives is all of the time, you know, and, and many of you, especially who are here with your husband or your wife, I, I can almost see you going like this. Are you hearing him? Are you hearing him? You know, did you hear that? You got to go, did I hear that? Because the problem is when we say, everybody needs to change. My husband needs to change. If only he would be different, things would be different in our life. My wife needs to change. All things would be different. My children need to change. Our church needs to change. The priests need to change. The government needs to change. Everybody has to change except me. Right? And Jesus wants to take you know, every time you're pointing a finger at someone, which is we are very good at that, we've got three fingers pointing right back at us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Point the finger at yourself that you are the one who is in need of change. You stand in the need of changing and conversion in our life. And conversion is an ongoing process. Ongoing. As long as we're trying, that's what makes God happy, our God. That we try, that's what makes Him happy. Our victory, you see, in this life is not so much that we will be victorious over our struggles. In other words, that you're going to leave here tonight and you're going to become this perfect husband all of a sudden, or perfect wife, or perfect Christian, that you're not going to be irritable anymore, that you're not going to use any bad language anymore, that you're going to be all of a sudden this incredibly patient person all of a sudden. That not work that way. Our victory is not in that we will be victorious over our struggles, but our victory is in the struggle that we struggle that we get up each and every day and we say, Lord, I'm going to work on becoming better today. I'm going to work on becoming better. Not that I'm already there, but I'm on the way. Christianity from the very beginning was known as the way. It wasn't known as Christianity or Catholicism. It was called the way because the followers of Jesus, his disciples, knew that they were on the way. They were walking towards the kingdom. They weren't there yet. And what about you? You think you're there yet? No, we're not there yet. That's why we continue the struggle. You see, the problem with the scribes and the Pharisees and the people who think they know it all, like the guy in the airplane, right? Okay? Is that they thought they were finished products. They already had all of the answers. I know it all. We don't know it all. That's why we are called to great humility. Jesus, the Bible says, even though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but rather he humbled himself, taking on the form of a slave. 
slave. For who? For us. Because Jesus was an other-centered person, not a me-centered person. It wasn't all about him. It was about the other. He didn't die for himself. He died for you and for me. He died for us. That's the way he lived, led his life. And that's what he's calling you and I to in this life as well. To lead our life, not for our sake, but for the sake of the other, those around us. And Jesus is admonishing all the people who thought they were finished products. They knew it all. The religious elite. And he's admonishing all of us. For many times we also may be so very good at talking the talk, but not walking the walk. See, a Christian can use all the right buzzwords. <clears throat> Read the Bible, attend church, and do all the churchy things, but may live a lie if he or she does not demonstrate the love of Christ in their daily actions. In this text, that we have just heard, there are five self-inflating behaviors of the scribes and Pharisees. The scribes were teachers and recorders of the law of Moses. They walked around in long robes in order to gain attention to themselves rather than dressing normally. They liked to be greeted with respect in public places and treated deferentially. They liked to have the best seats in the small synagogues where everybody could see them. They liked to have places of honor at banquets, the head table to the right of the host. They said long prayers for the sake of appearance. In fact, they do everything for the sake of appearance. They aren't praying devoutly to God, but are praying for show, to show how devout they are. That is why Jesus says, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. You know, when I was uh, in the seminary and I was learning a lot, because you learn a lot in the seminary, and I was sent, as I've told you before, to Mexico to learn Spanish and the culture there. And I was in the big town a very big town where they have a uh, railway station, trains. And you have to, in order to get from one train to the next, you have to go through a tunnel. And inside of the tunnel are all, all, the, all these people begging. And I was walking through the tunnel, determined just to walk through that tunnel without noticing any of the people around me. But for some reason, you know, I don't know, God has all sorts of ways, mysterious ways, to teach us, to admonish us, to wake us up. Hopefully, you're having some of those moments this week. And I was determined to walk through that tunnel without noticing anybody there that was in that tunnel. Because we can have a very superior attitude in our life. And I'm not telling you here that you need to notice, you know, just the homeless or the poor. People don't have to be materially poor to be poor. How many people in our lives are poor in terms of their spirit? They need a good word, a smile a phone call, somebody to pay attention to them. That's the real poverty today, according to Mother Teresa, who saw some of the greatest poverty. She said the greatest poverty is not material poverty, it's the poverty of love, people not feeling wanted or cherished. And so I was determined to walk through that tunnel without noticing anyone, but a young woman caught my attention. She must have been 25 years old. And she had a sign coming from her neck and the sign said, I am infected with the HIV virus. Estoy infectada de SIDA. I'm infected with the HIV virus. Please help me. And I don't know why I stopped in front of her. And I stood there and I said to her, I said, 
Um, I don't have any money, but is there some other way that I could help you? I don't have any money, but is there some other way that I can help you? And at that she stood up and she looked at me with eyes that I will never forget. And she said, hug me, hug me, abrázame. And you know what I did at that moment when she said, hug me? <laughs> I stepped back. And after a few moments, I did hug her. But it wasn't the same as if I had done it with the enthusiasm that should befall and mark a disciple of Christ. It wasn't the same as if I had done it right away. Recognizing Jesus in her. You know, I missed my opportunity that day to hug Jesus himself. Don't miss yours. He's not out there somewhere. He's around you. Many rich people put in large sums of money, the Bible tells us. Certain rich people were putting in large sums of money for the sake of appearance, just as certain people wore long robes and said long prayers for the sake of appearance. What about our own religiousness? Is it all for the sake of appearance? A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which were worth two pennies, the Bible tells us. Now the words widow and poor were intrinsically linked together in Jesus' time. Why were the widows poor? Because the Old Testament laws of inheritance prevented a widow from receiving any inheritance from her husband's estate. The inheritance went to the oldest son. So a widow had two choices. She could either beg or become a prostitute. They couldn't work. They had no rights. In the Old Testament, widows and orphans were often associated as people who experienced injustice. Both widows and orphans were the most vulnerable of people, and society often ignored their needs. In the Greek language, these small copper coins were called leptan. This was the smallest of Jewish coins just as a penny is the smallest coin within our American society today. It doesn't matter that in the eyes of the world what we have to give may be very insignificant like a penny. If we give it out of love and devotion and a spirit of generosity, it pleases God. It doesn't matter what you have or how much you have but the spirit with which you give it. Then Jesus calls his disciples over and says to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who were contributing to the treasury. He's telling his disciples to be like her. This insignificant person. The value of her gift was not determined by its numerical size, but what it represented. And that is everything she had. Did you hear what the Bible said? Everything. She gave everything she had. Her life. In other words, if Jesus is making an example of her, and she gave it all, she gave her life, in other words. We too are to give our life in imitation of the one who gave his life. 
She gave everything. Nothing was left. Nothing. She gave everything. As far as the widow was concerned, no one ever saw her. And no one saw her that day when she was going to that treasury to drop her coins, everything that she had. She thought she was invisible. That's how she lived her life. She, she thought she was nothing. She was one of those invisible people that no one ever sees. The scribes during Jesus' day were the elite of society, doctors of the law, long, with long years of study that made them the official interpreters of God's word. They were forbidden to receive pay for their jobs, so they lived on subsidies instead, a little from their students, a little from the poor box, a little from the temple treasury. They were invited to people's homes and accepted the best seats, best cuts of meat, and the best cups of wine. That's why Jesus says they devour the houses of widows because they would take from the treasury that others would bring in their simplicity. The scribes were the ones to watch. People watched them. They were the ones who you were supposed to imitate. They were the ones who you were supposed to pay attention to, and people did pay attention to them. But who does Jesus pay attention to in the temple? Jesus did not watch them, did he? He does not pay attention to them. Jesus pays attention to the widow. The widow did not catch anyone else's attention, but she caught Jesus's. You get it? You may think you're insignificant, unworthy, nobody notices you. I mean nothing. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. I've got nobody. You've got Jesus. He pays attention to you. He notices you. And he's calling you to do the same in your life with all those around you. You know, she didn't even have any meat left on her bones, let alone in her house to cook for the, for the scribes and the Pharisees. She was out of food, out of money. She had nothing in terms of things to give. That's why she seemed useless to the scribes and the religious elite. But to Jesus, she was not useless. She was not invisible. She was not insignificant. When widows lost their husband, they not only lost their place and name, but their face as well. She became invisible. No one saw her. That is no one except Jesus. He saw her walk to the temple treasury to give up her two coins. And something about the way she did it, something about the way she did it let him know that it was the end for her. That it was everything she had so that when she surrendered them and turned to go, he knew she had nothing left that was not God's. Her sacrifice was complete. So complete that Jesus calls his followers to witness this. We know her today because she held nothing back and this made her last penny a fortune in God's eyes. Some people today, you know, they tell us we have to give 10% tithing as we know it. But if you follow the example of the widow, you can see that she was a percentage giver as well. How much percent did she give? 10%? No, she gave 100%. Everything. She gave her life. That's what we are called to do as well, to give our life for God, for Jesus. And when you give your life for God and for Jesus, you give your life for others. 
You see, we generally admire this story for her generosity, but I wonder about that. What if she was a poor person today who sends her last penny to the 700 Club? Is it right for the poor to surrender their last to those who live more luxuriously than they do? Was it right for a poor widow to surrender her last two coins to a morally corrupt and bankrupt institution? Is this admirable or scandalous? I say it's scandalous. God doesn't desire 10%. God desires sacrifice, our life. We give sacrificially, not in percentage. Do not allow yourself to be taken advantage of by those who wish to exploit religion for their personal gain and profit. The sacraments are free. Grace is free. It's all given for free to us. You know, and yet we give our life we give our life as she gave to this corrupt institution, the temple. She gave it, and as scandalous as it is, she still gave it. And Jesus blessed it, didn't he? So many times, many people say, I'm not going to give to the church anymore because of this or this scandal. I give up. I'm not going to give anymore. That is a wrong way of thinking. Are you going to give up on your family just because one member has done something bad? We don't give up on our family. We love our family, as imperfect as that family may be. And in the church, we are a family as well. You know, maybe you have been hurt by somebody in the church, a priest or a bishop or a deacon or some church member has hurt you. And it's good you're here tonight. That says a lot about where your priorities are because despite of somebody in the church doing something to you you are here today because you know that it's all about Jesus well, on behalf of the church because I represent the church as a priest I want to apologize to any of you who might have been hurt by the church Whoever has done anything to you, they wouldn't have done it if they knew what they were doing. So forgive. Let go. You know, when Napoleon was invading Europe and conquering all of Europe, everybody was scared because this was Napoleon Bonaparte, the great conqueror, and he was conquering all over. And when he came to Rome, Everybody was scared. And Napoleon says, I'm going to destroy the church. And this one cardinal, old cardinal, was laughing as Napoleon was saying, I'm going to destroy the church. And this old cardinal is laughing in the corner. And he says, why are you laughing? Don't you know I have the power to destroy the church? And the cardinal looks at him and says, what makes you think that you can destroy the church when we have been trying to do it for 1,700 years <laughs> and haven't been able to? Either Jesus is a liar or he is faithful. Didn't he say, and lo, I am with you always until the end of the age? If there's any proof that this church that we are in is the church founded and guided and led by the Holy Spirit, it is that we are here today. After all of the scandals, and you think the scandals in recent memory are something, there was a period in the church where a majority of bishops did not believe that Jesus was God. It's called Arianism. That's why we have the creed today, the Nicene Creed, developed in the year 325. Because a majority of bishops at that time taught Jesus wasn't God, but the Holy Spirit led the church. 
as it leads her today. There was a period in the church where there were multiple popes fighting with one another. We've gone through it, we've been through it, and we will get through it. Jesus here nowhere praises the widow for what she is doing. He simply calls the disciples over to notice her, to see what she does, and to compare what everyone else is doing. He invites his disciples to sit down beside him and contemplate the disparity between apparent sacrifice and the real thing. Jesus does not dismiss the gifts of the rich. He simply points out that the major characters are minor ones, minor givers. And while the minor character, this poor widow, turns out to be the major donor. You see, Mother Teresa teaches us that we are not called to do great things in this life, but to do small things with great love. Small things with great love that could be as simple as a smile. I went to the hospital during my priesthood once and I met this 25-year-old young man who tried to commit suicide unsuccessfully. And I asked him, I said, you know, you're so young. Why is it that you want to give up your life? You have your whole life to live. And he says, you know, Father, that day that I tried to take my own life, I said to myself, I'm going to go walking. And I'm going to try to find one person that would smile at me. Needless to say, he did not find that one person that would smile at him. He tried to take his own life. He tried unsuccessfully, thank God. All it takes many times is just a simple gesture. Just a simple gesture. This is the last of Jesus' teachings that we receive here about the upside-down kingdom of God, where the last shall be first and the great shall be the servants of all. And the most unlikely people will turn out to have been Christ himself in disguise. When Jesus leaves the temple area, his public ministry is over. In four days, Jesus will also give it all up, his life, the two copper coins just like the widow was giving it all up, her life, so too Jesus in like manner gives it all up. The widow gave her all, gave her life. Jesus gave his life as well. The widow gave it all to a corrupt church, didn't she? She gave it all to a corrupt, corrupt church. Jesus gave his life for a corrupt world and a corrupt church as well. And before you say, yeah, all those bishops are corrupt and the popes, you know, and all the priests. When I say corrupt church, I mean everybody here. We are the church, are we not? It's not a building or an institution. We are the church and we are corrupt because we're sinners. And Jesus gave up his life for us. Now, if Jesus gave his life up for us, as corrupt as we are, as sinful as we are, why is it so hard for you to give your life up for all the people in your life who are corrupt just as much as you are? Why is it that hard if he gave his life? Why is it so hard for you to put up with all the people in your life? They put up with you. Jesus gave it all up, died for us, 
as sinful as we may be, and we are called to give it all up as well. She withheld nothing, neither did Jesus. This is why he calls his disciples over and over again, saying, this is what I'm talking about. Look at her. She walked into the temple with her last two coins in her hand, and she walked out again without them, totally unaware that she was being watched. Just like us in our world, so many times we are unaware of God's presence in our life, that we are being watched. Who are you out to please in this life? People or God? You can fool everybody around you, but you can't fool God. God knows our waking and our sleeping. God knows us. You see, this widow came in with no name and she left with no name. But you and I have an upper hand because we have been given a name. The first thing that happens at a baptismal ceremony is the priest asks or the deacon asks the parents, what name have you given your child? We receive a name. We are not nameless. How many times people say to me when I ask them, what is your name? They say to me, oh, Father, why, why do you want to know my name? There's so many people here in this parish. It's not important. It is important. Because we all have a name. It's important. God calls us by name. I have called you by name, says the Bible, by name. You know who didn't want to give people names? The Nazis. In the Second World War, what did they do with people as they entered concentration camps? They tattooed them with what? A number. You just were a number. As to the communists, you are just a number. To the Nazis, you are just a number. All you Star Trek fans, we are not the Borg. <laughs> we are not the Borg. We have a name. And that is why we need to know each other's names. Mm -hmm. So turn to your neighbor, somebody you don't know, and ask them their name. <laughs> One person. Okay, okay, okay. One person. Now, hello. That was the wrong neighbor. <laughs> Turn to someone else. Ask them their name. Oh, you already did that. Okay, that's wonderful because I... Our dignity does not come from the world, from what the world gives us. Our dignity comes from who watches us. God watches us. God knows us by name. You see how special you are? that he knows you by name. If only we would discover that, we would stop looking in the world for our worth, worth, for our dignity, when our dignity has already been given to us in that we have a name. And so now, please stand, and we're going to pray for a little bit before I give you the culmination of tonight. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a name that you have called us on the mission as we are sent forth, that we are not insignificant. We are not worthless. That we mean so much because we mean everything to you. And because we mean everything to you, we want to help others recognize their worth, their dignity, inherent dignity that nothing can take away. Nothing. No government, no person can take that dignity away. No system can take that dignity away. No disease can take that dignity away. 
No one can take that dignity away and nothing can take that dignity away for the dignity is ours because you love us. For it's not so important that we have loved you, but that you have loved us. It's not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us and has chosen us, called us, appointed us. That last verse, peace, is something that only the Lord Jesus can give us. Everlasting peace. As he has called us by name, that's what he wants us to internalize in this life. Peace, as he says, my peace I leave you. That's what we are here first and foremost to pray for. Peace for it to enter our hearts and fill us as we continue our journey with him, our rabbi, the one who has chosen us, as imperfect as we may be, to fill us with that peace, to know that it will all be okay, and to spread that peace to others. As we pray for them, we bring them words of comfort, soothing words and soothing ointment. My grandmother, prayed for that gift of peace for my grandfather throughout their whole marriage. 
she prayed for that and it didn't happen in his life until the very end until the very end let us hope that for all of us here today it won't take a cancer diagnosis for us to reshuffle the priorities in our life of what it is that is important that gift of faith and the gift of peace is something that the Lord comes to give each and every one of us because he loves us and you know one of the powerful symbols in this particular gospel passage that speaks to me and to my heart are these two coins and the translation in the Bible says the two copper coins worth two pennies two pennies my grandfather in his life was very much fascinated by the penny and after he passed away having made his confession going back to the church making his peace with the God who made him and after he went to be with God as I believe because once you have gone to confession and you confess your sins you are made as clean as this white paper your soul once you confess your sins there's nothing there going through life when we sin our life becomes like this our soul becomes like this and then God through his great mercy cleans us gives us a shower and our soul becomes like this we are Catholic we don't believe people become angels when they die they become saints the definition of a saint is not Saint Joseph or Saint Anthony or Saint Mary or Saint Faustina or Saint Mother Teresa the definition of a saint is anyone who has made it to heaven all the people in heaven are saints and I believe that my grandfather isn't my angel but is my own personal saint for he made it to heaven having had his soul wiped like this through the church you see what a wonderful thing is our church if only we would rediscover what we have the great treasure of our faith you know there's a lot of sects popping up around all over one of the more more popular ones in Mexico is called Luz del Mundo light of the world as they call themselves and their founder hermano Aron, as they called him he was a devout catholic for much of his life and then something happened and he founded his own religion and as he was dying he called for a priest to go to confession and receive absolution the last rites of the church and he made this powerful statement as he was dying para vivir en cualquier religión pero para morir solo en la católica to live you can live in any religion but to die only in the catholic faith 
only in the Catholic faith. We don't know what we have. When your soul is wiped clean and you don't have to pass anything, no passing go, you go right to heaven. And that's where my faith today tells me that my grandfather is. And that's the comfort my grandmother has as well. And you know, this gospel passage is so very powerful to me. Copper coins worth two pennies. My grandfather was very much fascinated by the penny from the United States. Remember, my parents were here and they used to send us money all the time. He was fascinated by the penny. We would have pennies everywhere when I was growing up. And let me tell you today, there is not a day that goes by that I do not find a penny somewhere. Not a day that goes by that I do not find a penny somewhere. For many of you here, you might say, well, that's just coincidence. There's pennies everywhere. Well, for you, it may be coincidence. But for me, it is my faith that is telling me that my grandfather is okay, that he's having the time of his life, that his life has just changed, not ended. And not only that, that he's proud of me, that he's watching out for me, and that he's praying for me because that's what the saints do. They pray for us. That's faith. And that is the gift that only the Lord Jesus can give us. The gift he wants to give all of us here tonight. So as to live and internalize his peace, his love as we are sent on the mission. And we stand and pray. Lord Jesus, close your eyes at this time. Bathe yourselves. Bathe yourself in that soothing mercy of God that we have taken in. Bathe yourself in his presence here today that we have felt flowing among us. As he continues to drop pennies on us from heaven to let us know how loved we are, how significant we are. You are so significant to me, says the Lord Jesus that I have died for you. And you know how I know right now that Jesus loves each and every one of you here tonight? Because I feel something in my heart right now, that warmth and that fire. And I stand here with this stall on in the person of Jesus. The priest takes the place of Jesus. That's why I have the stall on here right now. I stand here in his person and so I know. You know how I know? I'm convinced that each and every one of you here tonight is loved. And you know how I know that? Because I love you. And when I say I love you, that means Jesus loves you. All that we need is right now to be convinced of that in our lives in the midst of all that we may go through and as Jesus loves us to then be moved to love all those around us I love you says the Lord just as you are 
And I'm calling you to love all those around you as well. So we thank you, Lord, this evening for that great love because you have chosen us. It's not we who have chosen you, it's you who have chosen us and have appointed us on this mission to spread your mercy. As mercy has found us in that temple, we are here in the temple. We are that widow, feeling unworthy, insignificant, and mercy has found us as corrupt as we may be. And so we thank you for that great gift tonight, O oh Lord. And out of that gift, we glory. Please be seated at this time. Just as the widow gave, not from her surplus, but from her want, we too tonight will be moved to give towards the construction of the classrooms for the children here at St. Anthony, that they may continue to learn in their own classroom, have their own space. And so in the name of the Lord Jesus, I want to thank all of you for your great generosity to St. Anthony Church, St. Anthony Parish. Please be very, 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 very generous. Give from your heart. Don't give because I've told you to give. Give because you want to give.
before you close this evening, there's a uh, young girl and her family. They're not here, but a young girl in the neighborhood is pregnant and the family's considering abortion. So okay. I promised that we would say a prayer. Thank you. 
given us and lifted our hearts to mm-hmm. him, didn't they? Oh, yes. Yeah. Father Bob mentioned tomorrow we will have our reconciliation service, so um, I will preach about forgiveness, letting things go, uh, and then we will have the opportunity to experience, because we are Catholic, we love sacramental signs, we are about not just hearing, but also tasting experiencing in a real way, in tangible ways, uh, the forgiveness, the touch of God. And so, confession is one of those hidden treasures of the church that we don't know what we have. And so, we will experience that in a very real way tomorrow evening. And Father Bob and Father Steve have invited uh, 12 priests and uh, I have been told by them that uh, uh, one of the priests is very hard of hearing and so uh, uh, I'm sure he might get a lot of... We won't tell you which one though. (laughs) But all kidding aside, make sure you invite lots and lots of people. Okay, uh, let's make them work. Okay, uh, let's make all of us work because we're here for you. We, the priest doesn't become a priest for himself. The priest is a priest for you. We are priests for you. And so um, invite, invite as many people uh, as you can tomorrow to come, even if they haven't been here for the past three nights. But all of you, make sure that you do not miss tomorrow evening, because that will be like a a seal, a seal on this four-night experience of God's mercy. A seal will be placed on all that you have experienced here during these past three evenings when we have bathed ourselves in the mercy and the love of God. Uh, People have been asking about the uh, talks that, and the reflections uh, from these evenings. They have been videotaped and they are available for you on a website called biblecatholic.net. You can write that down. BibleCatholic.net. You can easily remember that. BibleCatholic.net. There are also other resources on that website for your spiritual growth. Um, Other past videos that I have uh, done as well are on there. And also um, Catholic resources. Some, most of them are free for you to grow in your, in your Catholic faith. And so that's BibleCatholic.net. Thank you for being here as we stand and we conclude with prayer this evening.
our Father. some 48 years during her marriage for my grandfather's conversion. Nothing is impossible with God. The people of the Ukraine prayed for 46 years. What is it that you're praying for? God knows what's in your heart. Maybe you're praying for people in your life that need the touch of prayer. We are Catholic, and so we believe in sacrifice and giving things up. You have given up already three evenings. They are not wasted evenings. God sees what you have been doing in your prayers, your sacrifice. Right now, I want to ask you to pray for a young lady who is contemplating. That's what Father Bob told me when he came over to me. He said, pray for a young lady who's contemplating having an abortion. All things are possible with God, right? That's what we believe. We hope against hope because that hope has a name and his name is Jesus. And so we pray for her and for all those people in our lives, because we are not selfish people. We haven't just come here for ourselves. We come here to be better, to be better husbands, better wives, better neighbors, better siblings, better Christians, better followers of the Lord Jesus. And so we pray, O oh Lord, not just for ourselves, but for all those dear to us, as we offer you these evenings, this time with you, this grace-filled time, and as you have blessed it, so we ask you to bless us and those around us. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be merciful, just as your Heavenly Father is merciful. Go in peace.
And that will be the closing hymn. Because I love this one. And Frank is so nice. 636. Like I should talk, okay? <laughs>